Good morning. Let us begin our prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord, Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always precede and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Amos. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel, and no one with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the, the one who speaks with truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you should not drink their wine. For I know how many are your, are, are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is a portion of Psalm 90, and we will pray this responsively by first verse. So teach us to number our days. Return, O Lord, how long will you tarry? Be gracious to your servants. Satisfy us by your loving kindness in the morning. Make us glad by the measure of the days that you have afflicted us and the years in which we have suffered adversity. Show your servants your works and your splendor to your children. May the graciousness of the Lord our God be upon us. Prosper in work. Prosper our handiwork. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render in an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The word of the Lord. The 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. He said to him, teacher, I've kept all these things since my youth. Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, the man was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> As we know, the Gospel doesn't begin and end with the way we hear it on the Sunday. We have a passage from that. And I think really for us to get into the, the story well, we have to remember the second to last line, which of course was something that really would have caught us last week of last week's gospel. I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. That's kind of harsh. And actually, the, the focus of last week's gospel was a little bit different, but it's the kingdom of God. And that's where this gospel really picks up. And so, the kingdom of God. It is basically just another way of saying the way of life of Christians or Christianity or the life of a disciple, a follower of Christ. It's a life of faith. But it is, and make no make no, uh, just make sure you're sure of it, is that it's different than the world. And if it's not, it's not the way of God. So we have to understand that the way of God is certainly different from the way things go on in the world with other people. It's a way of faith. This young person, this young rich person who comes to Jesus he is certainly a person who is a person of great faith. He is a person who has lived his faith. And that is not really the issue. Now, you can imagine with this little vignette that happens, this rich person goes away and he's grieving. You know, if you were a poor person at the time, you might look at that and kind of chuckle and say, <laughs> yeah, you're not going to get in, are you? You know, you're rich and you have all this. And, and you know what? That would be jealousy. Now, the rich person, this young man, among other things, certainly wants to justify himself in his way of life. And the fact is, he's just not willing to go all the way. He's not really willing to take the next step. 
And if we think about this gospel in those perspectives, the poor person looking and kind of getting a little bit of a charge out of that, and then the rich person wanting to justify themselves, that's the wrong attitude. Both these people or both these groups, that's the wrong attitude. That's not what this gospel is about. And it's, it's really to be unchristian, to take and to look upon others who are blessed in any way and be jealous of them and, and, and take joy in their hardship or their, their lack of success or whatever. And it most certainly is inappropriate and very much unchristian to have the attitude of the fact that we want to just justify who we are because we're just so wonderful. So that's just really not the right way. It's not the kingdom of God. It's not the way of Christians. It certainly is not the way of faith. To focus as this does, and it's a purposeful, easy way to focus on material things, which brings us into the deeper reality. Um, to focus purely on the material things is also really incorrect. It's too shallow. It's secondary and it's superficial. It's not the message that we are really called to hear. Because really the material things that we have, whether it be, and again, it's an issue in the time of the gospel, whether it be money or, or, or land or wealth in that sense, it also applies to having authority or power or more of a voice in society. And that goes with this whole context for this person who approaches Jesus. All those things really are secondary because what is most important is the mind, it is the heart, and it is the soul, which governs all else. They're far more important. And that's the reality that Jesus speaks to. Now, this person, really, the example that this person provides is not, unless you really wanted to become an itinerant preacher, is what this guy was looking to do. The story doesn't directly apply because go and sell all you have. What itinerant preacher really can walk around and have all that authority and yet be a servant? So he had to kind of let go of all those control issues. What kind of an itinerant preacher could run around having tons of material goods? The job for which he was applying, if you will, the position that he wanted as a follower of Christ necessitated that he give up his physical things, give those things to the poor in an act of service. And that was a specific, particular way of life. So again, really the deeper issue is the mind, the heart, and the soul. It's more of the attitude that we bring. And this is really important for us to, to, to really follow through in this story. What is our attitude towards faith? We hear and have heard frequently in previous weeks about the complainers, the gripers. Wrong. It's not Christian. Those who are searching for exceptions. Well, he said that, but he really means, and let me whip out this little passage. And if you kind of read this thing this way, standing on your head, you know, with the light just so, you know, people go through all kinds of spiritual gymnastics to make scripture say what it doesn't say. Those who rationalize or excuse poor discipleship, that's not, again, Christian. That is not the way. Do you ever think, why does Jesus say, why do you call me good when God alone is good? Is because Jesus as the son of God, which this guy does not really know he's the son of God at this point. He approaches Jesus as a great teacher, as a, a good rabbi, as possibly a prophet. Jesus is always pointing towards the Father to do the will of the Father. Even the Son, the Son of God, does the will of the Father. So there is one message, and that message is to, fall, uh, to follow the will of the Father. And so, again, rationalizing, making excuses is not discipleship, and it is not Christian. It's not following. The other thing, too, which has been brought up, and we remember the gospel, I think it was two weeks ago. Remember, we were cutting off things. If your hand leads you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, rip it out. Um, it's because of the scandal that poor Christian behavior provides that we need to remove from our lives those things which are inappropriate and unchristian. It's not, again, all that ugly dismemberment or, uh, you know, literal physical things. But you know what? We have to be conscious of what our words and our actions are and how they affect others. And that is also part of being 
the follower of the father. To scandalize or to inhibit, to get away uh, or to push people away because of the way we act is polar opposite from being Christian, a follower of God as you can get. So to make the point, Jesus tells a story. And it's a simple story. And I've got to tell you, as someone who has spent many years in the seminary as a degree in scripture, and who's been preaching the word of God for 30 years, I have heard this taught this way many times. And what it is, is the, the camel and the needle's eye. There is a, a thought or a theory or a, a group of people who say, well, what that really means is in the gate into Jerusalem, there's this gate called the needle's eye. And it's really small because, you know, for defense purposes and stuff like that. So when the camel gets there all laden with its, its, its goods and stuff, you got to unburden the camel, take all that stuff off, shove the camel through the hole, and then you get all the goods in. It's possible. I heard that story for years, and, and I heard it justified by scripture scholars and theologians or people who claim to be. And guess what? It's wrong. There is no analogy that way because we have to listen to the second part of this teaching because what happens when the disciples are thinking this big camel and a little sewing implement that's impossible you couldn't even probably get a camel hair through the eye of that needle let alone the whole rest of the beast and they're saying well that's what do we do it's impossible and jesus says you're right for you, it is impossible, but for God, all things are possible. And it goes back to exactly what happens in the beginning of the story, is faith in God. You are not, and I am not going to save myself. And we should not act as though we are, thinking we know better and we're doing our things our own way, all those things I've already discussed, because God's going to do it. But it's got to be God's way, because that's the way he created us. That's a false story, that whole thing of the gate and the... You know, it's made because then man is in control. I can stuff that camel through that hole. I could take all those packs off. It's going to be a burden. It's going to be, you know, so you, you spiritualize that rationale that that's really what Jesus meant. And he didn't. With God, all things are possible. That gets us to this young man again. He didn't want to make the next step. He stopped short. If you think about it, especially now as we're, we're kind of getting back into the, the flow of things uh, with school starting and stuff like that. And I tell you, you can go in any store, they're already preparing for Christmas, you know, shop now because by the time November hits, they'll probably have Easter stuff out. But anyway, as you think of the holidays, this is a great image or think of somewhere you want to go that you really just want to be. You do all the preparation, you do all the planning, you travel, you do all the things you need to do, and you get to the door of where you want to be, that wonderful hotel, your relative's house, then turn around and go home. That's exactly what this young man does. He's worked all his life, a faithful person. Jesus saw him and loved him and said, wow, this is, this is a good follower. But he needed for what he wanted to do to go the next step, and he wouldn't do it. So it's a big, wonderful journey. You know, when you're, you're going to somebody's house, the river through the woods, the grandmother's house we go, or you're just going away on a vacation and you just get there, you get off the plane, you go through all those things, you get your luggage and you go home. How horrible. Because the kingdom of God, the door is open and it's never gonna be closed. And it's not open just a little bit, it's open wide. The decision to walk in is ours. We have to walk in. We have to choose to enter. And as foolish as it would be to prepare for a journey or to get and go through a long process and to get to your goal and then turn around and just quit is, is foolish and stupid. It's the same thing with religion. It's the same thing with our faith. It is the kingdom of God. The doors are flung, they're wide open. And you can say, well, I'm imperfect. God's got that covered because he sent us a savior who for, forgive, forgave and saved us from our sins. Even those obstacles are gone. But you know what? We need to be the ones who walk through the door. And that's what this gospel is about. So when we hear last week about never entering, it's because we're not walking through ourselves. It's not because God slammed the door. You're not getting in. No, the door has been made wide open. When Jesus died on the cross, that door was made open and it can never be closed again. It can never be made more narrow. But you know what? People will try to make it more narrow. 
but people will. The Father will not. And that's again why Jesus points us to the Father. God so loved the world that he sent his Son. And so the invitation today is such a wonderful invitation is to walk into and be a part of that kingdom of God. And if those words don't work, just being a good Christian, being a good follower, a lover of God and a lover of our sisters and brothers, the greatest commandment. That is the opportunity and the invitation today. However, the story of that person is the story we have to worry about. It's not the judgment of God. It's the reluctance of the person of us. What's the next step that God is asking us to take that we may be reluctant to take? We really don't need to do that, do we? Again, that's that rationalization, isn't it? Well, that person's not doing it. That's another stupid argument. We need to walk through the door. God wants us to be there. We want to be there. Our sisters and brothers need us to be there as well as they. And we need to help each other in, in, in taking that step, which is easy in a sense, but it takes that next step that sometimes we are reluctant to do. That's today's invitation. It's a wonderful, wonderful gospel. And the frustration that you can just hear, I know when I taught, but what, you know, there's always a but when you tell a story or you tell a wonderful gospel story and the disciples do the same thing. Well, that's not possible. And Jesus says, you're for you, you're right. But for God, it is. And so the God who created the universe, I think he gets us through the door, doesn't he? But we want to want to, we're going to have to want to walk through that door. So God will bridge the universe for us as he has. Provide more love than we could ever know or hope for. More blessings, more wonder, more joy. But we're the ones that get in the way. And God forbid we get in the way of others. So let's set that aside and not go away grieving like this young man did. He was too attached to whatever, to meet the goal that he wanted to meet. Today, the kingdom is wide open and it will be tomorrow and it will be for all eternity. Let's walk through. May God be blessed. Amen. Let us profess our faith. We believe. The Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, God from God, true God and true God, begotten of God, made, one being with the Father, to whom all things were made. It's for our salvation, taking down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He is sent into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no more. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who sees in the Father and the Son, to the Father and the Son, who is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. One baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look to resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In gratitude for all we have received, every perfect gift that comes from God above, we gather to offer our intentions, petitions, and thanksgivings to God. We pray for the church founded on the gift of your word and for all who gather to worship, praise, and work. Pour your blessings on Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, presiding bishop, our Bishop Kevin, and our clergy and leadership. Pray for the church. May we who witness your saving acts in the world be ever grateful for every perfect gift, which comes from God above. 
We pray for the world, your greatest gift to us, and the gift of all creation. We pray for the welfare of our planet and for the wise stewardship of our world. May we who witness your power in the world be ever grateful for every perfect gift, which comes from God. We pray for the work of our church in the world. As we enter this season of, of intention and focus on the gifts that we give, inspire us to be generous with our time, our talent, and our treasure. May we who witness the impact of our gifts in our community be grateful for every perfect gift, which comes from God above. We pray for our neighbors and all who need our request of prayers. We remember the sick, the lonely, the suffering, those oppressed domestically or abroad, and those in prison. For all who give care and comfort to those in need, for the poor and those who sleep on our streets, for those we name now aloud or in the silence of our hearts. We pray for those whose needs are known to you alone. May we who witness your healing in the world be grateful for every perfect gift, which comes from God above. We pray for those who have died. May they rest in peace and may light perpetual shine upon them. Thank you especially for those members of our parish whose gifts to the church are felt beyond their lifetimes. May we who witness your eternal love in the world be grateful for every perfect gift, which comes from God. It is impossible to number the blessings we have received, the many gifts that we have been given and those we share in the, with the world. For what are you thankful for today? May we who witness our gifts at work in the world be grateful for every perfect gift, which comes from God above. I also ask for your prayers for Connie, for George, and we pray this and for every perfect gift, which comes from God above. With grateful hearts, we thank you, abundant God, for hearing the faithful prayers of your people, granting them grace and love and blessings for every perfect gift. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most, Most merciful God, God, we confess that we have sinned against you. And by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved you as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord. All things come of thee, O Lord. And of thine own have we given The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right to 
It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ, our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Christ. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Christ is risen. Christ is we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him, and with him, and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. And as one body of Christ, we pray together with our sisters and brothers who join us and are not able to be physically present or are not able to physically receive communion. And we pray our act of reception together in union, blessed Jesus, with the faithful gathered at every altar of your church, where your body and blood are. Stay. I want to offer you praise, thanksgiving. For the creation of blessings in his life. Let 
Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until by your grace I come to you glorious kingdom. Amen. As we receive together the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray together our post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have raised your sins as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and to strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. As you are um, sure are aware, this is the second week that we are in our stewardship month. In addition to the prayers of the people, which will be the same as they were last week, this week, and throughout the month of October, um, this week and included in your bulletin uh, would be reflections for our stewardship month. And as with many other places and institutions, um, this is a particularly uh, difficult and challenging time for us. So I encourage you to, to reflect on the challenges that stewardship provides and also to reflect on ways in which we might be able to, um, especially in times of difference, make a different change to what we do. And specifically what I'm thinking is with our talents and our time, maybe before you had not been a reader, and God may call you to be a reader. You may not have helped with communion, but now you may feel you want to here in church or out to people who cannot come to church or maybe in a nursing home or whatever, a hospital situation. There are many different ways. And also we're gonna need to do some fundraising and that to become involved with that and its planning and its execution is gonna be very important also. So I invite you to reflect on these things this month as we are engaging on our stewardship program. Last week, as many of you know, we had our church picnic and it was extremely successful and wonderful to get together. Uh, we had great attendance and uh, Sally did a great job with organizing it for all the people who helped her. It was a wonderful thing. And while we joke, Sally had great weather planned for us and it came out well. It actually probably by most people's estimation was a better time than what we normally have. We don't usually have our parish picnic in October, but the weather was beautiful. Um, It wasn't too hot and it wasn't too buggy. So uh, we're gonna look to do similarly next year, but thank you to all who participated in the picnic and to those who worked so hard to make it so nice for all of us. Any additional announcements, please? Giant and Weiss cards are available. Okay. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Amen.